and thank you for joining us for Church at Home. We want to encourage you to not just watch church today, but to have church. We believe that you can have church wherever you are. Rock Creek parents, we also want to help you keep your kids engaged in the relationship with God and experience the same dynamic teaching that they get here at church every weekend. Be sure to check out those free resources at rockcreek.online forward slash kids at home. Although we may not be in the same physical location, it's important for us to stay spiritually connected as a community. To stay up to date on all things Rock Creek, follow us on social media or visit us online at rockcreek.online. Finally, we wanna encourage you to continue to give generously. When you give today, you're not giving to Rock Creek, you're giving through Rock Creek. Your giving furthers our mission to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Now let's dive into this week's service. Hey, Rock Creek Church, welcome again to another weekend. This is Pastor Brian here. I'm so glad you joined us from wherever you're watching from, whether it's our YouTube channel, Facebook, or website. Make sure you share this content today with your friends. I'm telling you, as a church, I believe this is one of the most important teaching series we've ever done. And so if you're watching for the first time, welcome. Look for the notes wherever you're watching from. There's a link. You can download our app or download the notes. It'll help you this week as I give you lots of content today, lots of scripture. Uh, if you're new to Rock Creek, we always preach and teach from the Bible. And so I'm going to give you a funny stories. I'm going to give you great content, but it's going to be anchored to the word of God, which is the final arbiter of truth uh, when, uh, when it comes to all things uh, regarding our life. And so we're in this series called Different. As you can see behind me, we're talking about uh, what it means to be different in light of a culture that seemingly is going one direction. And so as Christians, we have a lens in which we view our life through, and it's very different from the culture we live in. It doesn't matter whether you're watching today from Washington State where our church is, or maybe you're on the East Coast or down in the South or Southwest, wherever you're watching from, there's a culture uh, where you live, but there's a culture in the world. And I believe that the culture that in which we are to uh, operate in is very different when it comes to our Christian faith. And so today we're discovering and talking through having different values in a culture that seems to be unholy. And for those of you who are new to uh, faith, um, maybe, maybe you haven't, uh, aren't familiar with the word holy, um, God uh, often, is his name is referred as the Holy One, the Holy One of Israel. He's holy. And so um, that lens in which we're going to uh, navigate today is what does it mean to be holy? What does it look like in our life as Christians to walk out holiness? And so there are different values that drive our Christian uh, behavior, our Christian lives, that's very different from culture. And so here's our theme scripture out of 1 Peter, uh, and, and it's kind of, a, a kind of the basis of why this uh, letter was written to these uh, people. It says this, this letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners. We learned last week that that word foreigner literally means to be a, a temporary resident. Uh, the exact word is sojourner. So it's like we're just passing through temporarily in the province of, and then he lists all these areas that the, the Christians have been spread apart in amongst these churches. Now here's the deal. Peter, also known as Simon Peter, one of the, the closest disciples of Jesus, uh, was writing to people who were go going through great suffering. They were going through trials. They were going through unfair treatment. There was a lot of fear and anxiety and concerns happening because literally Nero at the time was the leader of Rome, the Roman Empire, was killing Christians, literally burning the city. Uh, we're not exactly sure when First Peter was written, but somewhere between 60 and 65 AD. And, and it was a bad time to be a Christian. It was a bad time to follow Jesus in the midst of this great suffering suffering and persecution. And then to make it worse, they were all spread out. You know, some of us can relate to this, right? Over the pandemic in the last year, we've been isolated, alone from our community, alone from our families. Some of my grandparents watching today, it's like, we haven't seen our grandkids. Like, you understand this idea of being spread out away from community and isolated. And oftentimes I've noticed in my own life when we're isolated, uh, we, we uh, can get trapped in our own thoughts and we can actually uh, become very, very anxious, concerned and worried. And so Peter is addressing this going, hey, there's a, there's a way I want you to live. And, and, and he's encouraging them, even though they're, though they're going through hard things, about the kind of 
a culture that is different when it comes to Christian uh, living that's different from the world. And so I'm gonna read you a couple other scriptures then we're gonna get right into what it means to have different values in a, in a culture that seemingly is unholy. So here it is from Romans 6, 14. It says, sin is no longer your master for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And so as we define sin in this community, Sin is simply get missing God's mark, or God has a standard, and when we fall short of that standard, it's called sin. And as we learned last week, as Christians, we have different values, different standards, and different goals. And so values is what we're talking about today, the value that literally should drive all the decision-making in your life. And so it says, missing the mark is no longer your master. The sin, the struggle um, is no longer your master, for you're no longer living under the requirements of the law, you're actually living in what's called Graceland. It, it's Jesus has come and fulfilled the law. And because of his sacrifice, we can actually live in what's called grace land or we live in God's grace. That means we accept and receive the righteousness that Jesus provided. And in terms of our relationship with God, it's been restored. And, and this is important for us to understand that we're gonna be talking about sin a little bit today. We're gonna be talking about what it means to be holy. And I think you'll see it uh, better in Revelation 4 about who God is. It says this in Revelation 4, day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. So we see this beautiful picture of of heaven where everyone, including the angels, are rejoicing, going, God, you're holy. You're so holy, we're gonna say it again. And oftentimes you see this in scripture when a word is repeated multiple, it's actually in the original, it's not just multiple words, it's one with great emphasis. So it's, it's like this, holy is the Lord, holy is God. And, and, and again, his one of his main titles, which really is to give us a view into his character and nature, is that he's the holy one. And so we're gonna define what that actually means, but I think it's important for you to see a few other things first. So 1 Peter 1.13 says this, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So Jesus was his name, our savior, Christ is, is what he did. He's the anointed one. And so we see that when Jesus come, he's revealed to the world. We actually need to have preparation. So here's the reality, Christians. Uh, Jesus is going to return. And so Peter is reminding these, these Christians who are being treated unfairly, who are suffering, who are being persecuted, who are being martyred and murdered, he's reminding them, hey, Jesus is gonna return, so make sure you're ready. And so before we get into the holiness and what it means to live holy, I think it's important for us to understand what it means to prepare ourselves in the midst of unfair treatment, in the midst of being persecuted, in the midst of um, uh, all the concerns that kind of weigh our lives down at times, and what it means to be ready for the return of Jesus. So here's three things I think it means. That well, number one, we have to stay mentally alert. Okay, we have to stay mentally alert. This means clear thinking. The Bible says this, don't think on things below, think on things above. Get the mind of Christ. And so as we prepare in the midst of uncertainty in times that feel like they're unfair, we're being mistreated, we're going through hard times, whatever that is for you today, we need to make sure we ask the Spirit of God, the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, to help us stay mentally alert, to have clear thinking, to not think like the world, but to think like Christ. And as we prepare, Peter is also reminded, not only do we need to stay mentally alert, but we need to live a disciplined life, a life that's disciplined, a life that has self-control. We see this idea of self-control, this disciplined life, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit of God working in our life. And so as we yield to God's Spirit, the Spirit of God, in working in our life, it produces a what's called self-control, which means we live life a particular way. We allow biblical values to drive the actions of our life. 
And, and so we're going to dig a little bit into the actions because I think sometimes Christians, we've gotten out of balance either one way, either it's all about rules and regulations or it's all about God's grace and, and he loves you. He loves you and he does love you. Uh, and it's not all about rules and regulations, but out of our love for for God through the person of Jesus, we can live out a particular life through the Spirit's power. And so we got to live a disciplined life, a self-controlled life. And I think lastly, Peter is writing to us and saying, hey, keep our attention focused on what matters most. We want to have a faith forward viewpoint. And I think for too many of us, we focus on what's behind. For some of us who maybe didn't grow up in a Christian family, or maybe you're watching today, you haven't said yes to following Jesus yet, and you have a past. Like, it, like you're like nervous about someone finding out about your past, like not just past a year ago, but like last night, right? And, and so you just need to relax and, 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 don't, and don't get overwhelmed by that because here's the thing, we all have a past, but as we allow Jesus to transform us, we now can look forward with faith. We gotta keep our attention focused on the right thing. And if you're a Christian watching today and you continue are reminded of who you used to be, that is a ploy of the enemy, we call him Satan. And you need to make sure you respond to Peter's uh, exhortation, his encouragement to these Christians who are suffering going, hey, hey, keep your attention focused, faith forward on what's ahead, not what you're going through, not what you've been through, but what's ahead for you. And part of that being what's ahead for you is making sure that your values are different from what the culture says, because the culture is not God oriented. It's what we call unholy. And so there should be something about Christians that looks different from the world. There should be something about your life that when you're doing the everyday mundane stuff that someone goes, oh, they're different. I wonder what it could be. And when they ask you, you go, well, I have a different value system than what culture says because culture wants to take you away from God. But when we have the lens of the Bible, we actually get closer to God. And so here's what I've seen in my own life. And here's what I've seen uh, in, in, in other churches, not this church. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. There, there's some stuff in all the churches. And here it is. The greatest obstacle to following Jesus is actually a desire to fit into culture. I think one of the greatest obstacles that you and I will ever face is going, do I want to fit in or do I want to follow Jesus? Do I want to fit into culture? Do I want to blend? Do I want to kind of just do the everyday and not be too extreme? Because I mean, I don't want to be one of those crazy Christians that people are like, oh, they're one of those people. Do I want to fit in or do I want to follow Jesus? And I'm here to tell you, you can't always be popular and walk in the power of God hate to break it to you. I know there's some trendy preaching. There's some trendy pastors and maybe some of you watch them, but here's the deal. Uh, I'm nervous when you get more popular, but you lose the power of God because you're not having a value system that drives you to be holy like God is. And so we look like the world. We talk like the world. We live in such a way that there is no defining character qualities that different from an average person to a follower of Jesus. And I think this happens for a variety of reasons, but I've experienced this in my own life. And I recall when I first became a father, uh, I was left alone uh, for the first time with my oldest, who's now about to be eight. He was, uh, I think, two at the time. I know some of you are like, the first time you watched your kid, he was two. Well, the first time it was like for a long extended time. And so my wife had gone out to hang out with some girlfriends and have some alone time. And, and so I was responsible, not just for the prayer, which is typically my role when I was tucking Riker in, but I was responsible for the whole routine. And so here's my son laying in bed and he looked at me, I think it was about two, two and a half. And he said, dad, I want the good night song. And I began to panic because I'm like, I, I don't know the good night song. Like, what is that? And he, and he goes, I want the good night song, dad. Where's mom? <laughs> like, like every kid, right? Dad is struggling and, and mom is gone. And so I was getting, uh, I was moving into despair, to be honest with you. I was getting frustrated because I'm like, I started singing every song I could think of. And none of it was the good night song. You know why? Because my wife created the good night song. And so they had this special song and I didn't know the words. And so in the moment of frustration, I said this, and don't judge me, you might have said it. I said, Riker, I don't know the freaking words. And he just looked at me. And, and, and he said, what? And so I like, it, it was deep down inside and it came out again. I said, dude, I don't know the freaking words. 
And so that was the end of the night. I prayed for him, went to bed. Well, when his mom came home, she came in to check on him and he kind of woke up and I was there with him. And this is what he said. He, he ratted me out. He said, mom, I don't, I don't know the freaking words to the good night song. I don't know the freaking words to the good night song. And he said it over and over like a broken record. And my wife turned it to me and said, what did he say? I said, I don't know, but he needs Jesus bad. <laughs> he needs Jesus really bad. And, and, and here's the honest truth. Um, uh, I grew up in the kind of house that when you uh, fake cussed, you, you might as well just said the real thing. And so I realized that there was something in me that, that was getting close and I let it out. And so I, from that moment on, I thought, you know what? I'm not gonna say the word freaking anymore. And so I stopped saying it, but can I tell you what happened? I still thought it every once in a while. I still, in a moment of frustration, I was like, oh, don't say it because the kid is watching. And, and, and that's good, but it's not God's best for us. See, because on the outside, I was different, but I was still thinking about using the word. And so the inside was not different. And I think for too long, when it comes to this idea of different values that are actually like God or holy, we think, oh, it's just about the outside. It's just about the exterior. But in reality, church, it's more about the inside being transformed. And then eventually that affects the exterior. And so it's not enough just to cut out things and, and try harder. And it's about actually Jesus transforming your inside and working its way outside. And so here's why I think living holy or what the word defined is set apart. That's simply what it means to be holy. It means to be set apart, consecrated to God. See, because it's normal to be broke, it's normal to be hurting, it's normal to be frustrated, it's normal to be stressed, it's normal to get divorced once, twice, three times, it's normal to have fears, it's normal to have kids that are crazy, it's normal. But yet as Christians, we're called to be different, we're called to be holy, set apart, consecrated to God, not just on the outside, but starting on the inside that works its way out. And so here's why I think it's hard for, for us to live set apart to God. The first one is this, a mundane attitude towards sin. A mundane, that means like, ah, it's not that exciting, I'm not that interested. It's kind of this nonchalant, cavalier, mundane attitude towards sin. And so we think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Do you know that there are only a few things in scripture that is recorded as God hates? And one of them that is repeated is sin. God hates sin. And I know many of us are like, we don't let our kids say you hate one another, but like the reality is, hate is such an important word when it comes to God hating sin. We should not lose the, 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 the power of that word when it comes to God's holiness. Because God is so holy, he's called us as his followers to be holy. And I think for too long, we have a nonchalant, cavalier, mundane attitude towards sin, towards missing the mark. We're like, well, it's all God's love. He loves us, yeah, but basic doctrine. Can I help some people today? I know this is a different kind of message for a Sunday morning. We're gonna go a little bit deeper, but basic doctrine, God's love was, was literally birthed out of his hate for sin. Because sin separated his creation from himself. And so the gap had to be bridged by, the, by sacrifice, and that was Jesus. And so when we have a mundane attitude towards sin in our life, like we know what's wrong, but we're just okay with it, like we're moving away from God, not closer to God. And you might be saved. You might have put your faith and trust in Jesus, but we all know what's going on in our life, in your life. Like we know where we missed the mark and we know where we settled in. You could say this way, you begin to snuggle with your struggle. Like the sin that you're okay with, that you tolerate, it's this mundane attitude. And the Bible says, listen, that's not God's best for you. Look at it in 2 Corinthians 7, it says this, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So here it is, church. I want you to not have a mundane attitude towards sin. I want you to be so aggressive that you begin to hate the struggle and sin that you're experiencing in your life because that is not God's best for you. And the only way for you to experience freedom from that is to repent, to have what's called godly sorrow, that you realize that because God is holy, he hates sin 
sin. And when we as Christians continue to sin, what we're saying is we don't actually want to get closer to God. Listen, I am convinced there is nothing once you put your faith in Jesus that could take you out of God's hand. But there is a closeness that is hindered because you continue to, to sin when you know you shouldn't be. Just like my son and my daughter, actually both my sons and my daughter, I love them. They're always be in our family. I always be, will be their father. Nothing they could do could, could stop me from loving them. But when they obey my commands or disobey my commands, there's correction, there's closeness that's like, hey man, I don't know if you got what I'm trying to say. And it's the same way with our heavenly father. There is a closeness that is that is disjointed when we allow sin to rule and reign in our life. Genesis 4, 7, nothing is new. It says this in the original creation story. Sin is waiting to destroy you. Its desires is to what? Be your master, rule over you, but you must rule over it. And so we can no longer have a mundane attitude towards sin in our life. I'm calling our church community to get aggressive in our attitude towards getting sin out of our life that we wouldn't be okay or tolerate what's unholy because we serve a holy God. Number two, I think we uh, misunderstand living by faith. I've heard people say this before. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just fighting the good fight. The, the life we now live, we live by faith. And they quote Galatians, and here it is in Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I mean, that sounds really good. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the life we live, it's by faith. And that's true. But that doesn't mean that there's no work to be done. I want you to hear me. When you put your faith in Jesus, you are completely righteous, you're forgiven, you're adopted into God's family. That doesn't mean there's no work to be done. And for too many people and some currently trending preaching, it's like, hey, put your love, faith and love in Jesus, he loves you, and just float along and life will take care of itself. And what we discovered is that's a bad way to live out God's plan for your life. What we need to do is realize that we are completely loved, completely forgiven, and in response to that, a holy God who loved us so deeply to give us Jesus, we want our life to look different, set apart, consecrated. God is holy. And so his mercy is holy, his justice is holy, his righteousness is holy, his judgment is holy, and his people should be holy says this in Ephesians 4, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts. Come on, have that mental alert and attitudes. Put on a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. That means to be morally blameless, to be above reproach, to live in such a way that someone looks and go, I cannot believe you live like that. Why? Because my value system is different than the unholy culture in which we live in. And so we take it serious of the work that we need to do. So it's not just living by faith, it's living by faith in response to us being Christians, we now allow the sanctification process, that means being more holy day by day, to play its way out. But for too long, we just say, yeah, I'm just living by faith and, and, and life will take care of the rest. And that is a way to live a life that's anti-God, not closer to God. Lastly, number three, I think we marginalize certain sins. I think we marginalize certain sins. I think that we go, you know what? Um, there's some really big, bad, ugly sins and I don't even need to listen because all of us know. Usually it's like, um, if you grew up in church, it was like, don't dance or drink, uh, uh, you know, don't smoke. Like there's all the bad ones, right? Uh, and, and you could say it this way, like we marginalize certain sins, but like that, that mature audience show we love on Netflix, that, that, I mean, the Bible didn't really say not to watch that. Um, the, like the half naked pictures we keep posting on Instagram, not me, but like some people maybe watching today or other people in other churches, like, like God didn't really say I couldn't try to be an influencer and, and post some stuff. See some, some of you watching, you just got real quiet wherever you're watching. We marginalize certain sins. And so we go, oh, the big bad ones, I'm, I'm good with there. But like the gossip, 
the slander, the backbiting, the lust, the stuff we watch on our computer late at night when no one's watching that would not be considered holy. Come on, there, there's some stuff that we go, you know what? I'm just gonna push that to the edge. I'm gonna marginalize, and listen, God hates all sin. He is impartial. It's all against his character and nature, a holy God who requires his followers to be holy. Song of Solomon says it this way, chapter two, verse 15, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love. See, it's not the big things that cause the biggest issues, it's the small things that add up to become the big thing. I've said it before and I'll say it again because I think it bears repeating. We don't just fall into sin, we walk slowly towards that kind of life, a pattern of it. And so it's small decisions, like these little foxes that could ruin the vineyard. We, we allow sin to have a foothold in our life. And those small decisions become one big decision and ultimately can wreak havoc in our life. And so as your pastor, I'm not trying to beat you up, I want you to grow in your faith. I want you to be closer to God. I want you to realize that when you have the value system that Christ gives us, there is a response inside of us, or at least there should be, that goes, I wanna be holy like the God who saved me. I want my life to be different. I want it to make a difference. I wanna know God more today than I did yesterday. And so there are some things that we can't have a mundane attitude towards, and sin is one of them. We can't just live life by faith and expect that there's no putting on of the new nature. That requires work, it requires effort. We gotta put on the new nature. And we gotta make sure that we don't marginalize one sin over the other. Because people watching today, you might have a sin that I don't struggle with, and I might have a sin that you don't struggle with. And so if we marginalize the things of other people that are hard for them, but easy for us, we'll continue to miss God's mark. And so here's how I think we can live out this idea, this principle, this biblical truth, this value system that, how do we, how do we live different in an unholy culture? I think number one, we have to reject what I call the happiness theology. We have to reject it. Some of you are like, what does that even mean? I'm gonna tell you. I think the culture value is actually that, that you would be happy. I think, especially in America, the, the, the value that drives everything is just be happy. If it makes you happy, do it. If it makes you happy, go for it. If it feels good, that's your ticket. But the reality is God never called his people to be happy. He called his people to be holy. And so if you're a Christian watching today, I wanna encourage you. God is not interested in you being happy. God is interested in you becoming like him, which means you must be holy. First Peter 1.14 says it this way. So you must live as good, obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. So Peter is literally telling them, hey, I know it's been hard. I know you're being unfairly treated. I know you're going through some difficult times, but hey, remember who you used to be? You used to go after your own desires. You used to be what's called unholy and you used to fit into culture and blend in and, and you were most popular. And, but, but when you met Jesus, he changed you. He transformed you from the inside out. And now there's a desire to actually obey God's word, obey his commands, to be holy as he is holy, to be set apart more morally blameless, above reproach, consecrated. This is the kind of church that Jesus is returning for, a spotless bride. Men and women of God who are okay with being different, who are okay with, as they walk into the room, going, what's different about them? Not in an arrogant way, not in a boastful way, not in a judgmental way, but in a holy way, that I'm okay with saying no to some stuff that the culture says, what's wrong with you? Because I wanna be closer to my God. I wanna be closer to God. Number two, I think we have to do this. We have to live a God first life. 1 Peter 1.15 says it this way, but now you must be holy in everything you do. Whoa, everything? <laughs> everything. That translation actually means everything. In everything you do, be holy, just as God who chose you is holy. 
For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Could they use the word holy any more times? I don't think so. The word holy is used 600 times in scripture. Why? Because it's the primary uh, attribute and character quality of our God, the Holy One. And so his people are also called to follow who are his image bearers, who represent Christ everywhere we go. We are called to be holy, to be set apart, to be different, to be different. And I think it's important for us to realize that a God first life means that other things can't be first. Other things can't be first. And so if you want to actually live different, the value in which we go after, as I said earlier, we have different standards, different values, different goals. We have to put God first above our spouse, above any relationship, above our work, above our kids, above accolades and accomplishments, above stacking cash in our bank accounts or getting that promotion. We have to put God first. And anything that takes place before God needs to be cut out. See, if we live according to the culture's value, which is our happiness, what we end up doing is worshiping things like comfort, pleasure, external things. Things that aren't necessarily bad on the surface level, but they shouldn't be priority in our life as followers of Jesus. And so a God first life means we don't, we don't live or buy into the happiness theology. We buy into the I'm called to be holy theology, to actually worship God as God, not pleasure, not comfort, not the next vacation, not the next promotion, not the next relationship that satisfies our our physical, even though we are maybe outside of God's best for how that relationship should be played out. You all know what I'm talking about. Like it, it has to be a point in our walk with God where we go, you know what? I want more of God than I want more of the world. And can I just be honest? For many of us, we have too much world in us and no room for God in us. And so I'm challenging our church in this season to step up our desire to hate sin, to break off the cycles of sin and find some freedom and focus on putting God first. Which leads us to our last thought, number three. I want us to aim for personal transformation, not behavior modification. Because some of us Christians watching it, you're like, oh, I've heard this story. I've heard this message, Pastor Brian. You just want us to like not have any fun. You just want us to follow all the rules. I thought Jesus came to fulfill the law. Listen, I'm not saying I want you to change your behavior. What I am changing is asking you to change is letting Jesus grab a hold of your heart. And when he grabs a hold of your heart, the exterior, how you live out that salvation, it is sanctified. It becomes more consecrated to God, which means your life should look different. First Peter 1.18 says it this way, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited. You inherited a life that was separated from God and it was not paid with mere gold or silver which loses their value. It was the precious blood of Jesus, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. See, listen, your life was purchased and it was a hefty price. It required a sacrifice and Jesus gave his life so that you could know God in heaven forever. But as you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he says, now be holy. You've been saved, now get sanctified. Be consecrated to God, set apart, be different. Because here's the honest truth. Living holy isn't the path to knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus is the path to living holy. So it's not about behavior modification. And it's not about just living in the love of Jesus. It's about living in the love of Jesus and knowing him more. And that in response compels us, or at least it should, to live life differently, to hate sin, to cut it out of our life, to put God first, to reject the happiness theology of the Western world and go, actually, I'd rather be holy than just happy. And so you know what? That relationship that isn't being practiced in God's way, I'm cutting it out. The way I've been lacking integrity in how I've been working, I'm cutting it out. The way I've been abusive or with my spouse or my child, I'm cutting that out because that is sin and God hates it and I'd rather be holy than happy. So church, hear my words. Living holy is not the path to knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus is the path to living 
holy. And as you do, I'm believing this, God's spirit will come and help you live out God's purpose for your life. And your purpose for your life is to be holy as God is holy. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for every single person watching today. In this moment, I pray that you would convict, arrest, pinpoint areas in our life that have missed the mark where we have allowed sin to maintain a hold in our heart. And I pray today that we would all take a moment to evaluate and repent of that sin and turn back to you, God, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to help us, again, walk out your purpose for our life. If you're watching today and you're not a Christian, I wanna encourage you right now to pray this prayer right after me. And today can be what we call the beginning point of your spiritual life. The Bible says this in John chapter three, that you're born again, that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're forgiven. The shame, the guilt is taken off of you. And then he calls you to follow him in a holy life. So if you're ready today, I want you to pray after me. Today, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. Today, Jesus, make my life new. Today, Jesus, I'm becoming a Christian, your follower. Lead me, guide me. Thank you for providing new life. In your name we pray, amen. I wanna encourage you, church, as you pray those prayers, as you take spiritual steps, would you let us know that you did? Go right now to rockcreek.online slash next and fill it out saying, I said yes to Jesus, getting water baptized, dedicating your kids right here at our in-person facilities. Whatever it is, we wanna help you walk that out. If you need prayer, we're here for you. We have people praying for you, believing for you. As we wrap up this service today, I wanna encourage you to partner with us financially. As you give today, your giving empowers us as a church, not only to broadcast on the weekend, but to make a difference across the globe. Thank you so much for your generosity. Hey church, look at me. Not only are you holy, but you're doing better than you think. God bless. Thank you again for joining us for Church at Home today. We wanna help you grow in your faith as you take your next right step. If you said yes to following Jesus, need prayer for anything or to get connected in a more meaningful way, please visit us at rockcreek.online forward slash next. We want you to know that we are praying for you. We believe in you. We are always here for you. We hope to see you online next week.